I don't, well, I, you're, you have the questions. You're the man. Mm -hmm. um, no problem. You know, it's we, like, yeah. Yeah, we can uh, go ahead and get started. I'm, I'm down here in Florida, so, yeah, it's it gets a little okay. hot, a little warm. All right. All right. Uh, give me one second, as a matter of fact. Okay. There we go. We can display our names, and we'll go ahead and get started. Awesome. All right, man, I appreciate you being here. All right, how y how you guys doing? My name is Volsi. I'm here with the homie Nate. This is another edition of Atheist Testimonials where we talk to black atheists about how they became um in their position or if they were always non-religious, how it was growing up in a religious society. I appreciate Nate for being here. Nate, go ahead and introduce yourself to the people. All right. Well, my name is Nate Robinson. I'm from Columbus, Ohio, born and raised. Uh, how long have I been a non-believer? Yeah, that was actually going to be my first question. How long have <laughs> you been a non-believer? I'd probably say close to 15 years now. Close to 15 uh, years. Yeah, it's It's been a process. Uh, but it's been a good process. A lot of self-introspect. Uh, um, when you go and reevaluate your belief system, um... Mm -hmm. It's a it's a huge journey. Um, it's a huge journey. I don't think it's a journey that could be taken lightly, especially if you're someone like myself that grew up as a Christian. Um, it's you know you, it's drilled into your mind every day, all day and night that blah 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 blah. This is it. This is the way it is. There's nothing else, nothing more. It then you start looking around you and it's like, wait a minute. The world doesn't work exactly the way y'all been telling me. So here's my questions. Um, especially when it comes to the, uh, uh, in line with science. Um, I already have an, uh, I've always had a love for science ever since I was a little kid. Same. And uh, it's, it started out with, this is just science in general. Then when Star Trek, when I saw Star Trek for the first time, I was like, man, is this the future? <laughs> is this what it could be? You know, so I, I was all excited about that, you know. Uh, you know, and then Star Wars came out. Now, the first time the first oh, time I went to go see yeah. Star Wars, I, I got scared. I was, what, maybe nine, ten years old. Like, oh, uh -huh. no, I don't want to go see that. <laughs> and my mom and dad were so disappointed because they were taking me and my brother to go see it. But then my uh, cousins... Uh, took me out and for whatever reason maybe I grew up a little bit more or maybe I was just comfortable more comfortable with them but I went to go see Star Wars and again you know space starships going faster than the speed of light you know it's like wow that was just amazing to me and then that and then eventually it dived into or I, I branched out into other branches of science that I really enjoyed as a little kid um that was that was great um it was I've, I've always had that natural curiosity uh so that you know it's i remember one summer just opened up some encyclopedias that my mom and dad got and just reading through them you know uh -huh. i got this about 13 years old i got this niche to just read 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 and then, so i read a lot I, I read through those some of the encyclopedias and uh it was just interesting to me you know uh, I read something about dog behavior, so forth and so on. That was really interesting to me. Mm -hmm. um, read more about other like medicine, other branches of science. It was just really cool to me. And that was, that's how it was. And then at that time, since I was indoctrinated, I was like, well, this is how God made everything, so forth and so on. Uh, but little did I know the journey that I would have years later when it comes to that. Yeah. Yeah. You, you know, it's, um, it's interesting how how similar my my story is as well because I was always I was always big into science and history, science and history. Yeah. I loved history. I love science, you know. Um, but I always saw that there wasn't a lot of history in history books. Not a lot of people look like us, you know. Even no. when they got to the part of Egypt, I was like, hold on, this is in Africa, but they don't look like us, you know. what I mean, because we know how that go, why they did that. But it, exactly. Elizabeth so, Taylor is Cleopatra. Exactly. I'm like, come on now. <laughs> Elizabeth Cleopatra. We know Gil Cleopatra. Brenner. 
<laughs> yeah, exactly. What's in your brain in one of the stories? One of the yeah, yeah. I think it was in Moses or something like that. It was on like okay, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. But so, like, it was really, really interesting to me. And like, when I started growing up and I started seeing that a lot of history doesn't match what the Bible is saying, a lot of science doesn't match what the Bible is saying, you know. And mm-hmm. just like how you said in, in sci fi, like, I think one of the things that probably sparked my question it wasn't the first question I had, but it sparked it was mm-hmm. when I was watching the same thing, Star Trek. I watched Star Trek. Yeah. I watched yeah. DS9, as a matter of fact. I watched DS9. And my mom walked in the room, and she, and she was like, oh, what is this? You know, I'm a kid. I'm like, oh, mom, this is like a TV show of like a thousand years in the future, right? And she yes. said, oh, he said, Jesus is going to come back by then, so don't worry about it. But so it sparked my interest all like, wow, am I going to miss all that technology growing up? You know what I mean? Is he going to come back by the time I'm old? You know what I mean? Like, what's going to happen when Jesus comes back? You know, and I, I, I even, uh, I was one of those, like you said, inquisitive kids. You know, um, yeah. My dad had a, had a, the medical dictionaries and everything like that, and I was born in eighty seven, and so early nineties. Okay, is like, yeah. Early nineties when people are still still starting to learn about AIDS and everything like that, and that's the first time I saw acquired immune deficiency syndrome in in a medical book, you know, and you know it kind of scared me because I, I I was like you know I'm like what seven years old right now, if I get it I'm going I'm only gonna live fifteen years because you know technology back then wasn't that good, I'm only gonna live fifteen right. years. I'm like oh dang I could die at like twenty five or something like that. And again, my mom's going like 25, Jesus will be back by then. You know, so it's like, yeah. I'm not going to be in my 20s. Yeah. You know, it, it really yeah. sparked those questions. And that's when I think I started really questioning things. Like really questioning, yeah. like, what exactly do, do I believe? So like really interesting. You know, and I, I see that a lot. We all get the same type of, um, a lot, a lot of curious kids follow the same yeah. type, of, type of journey. Well, I was, I was going to ask because with me, like speaking of first questions, my first question on you know seeing that this doesn't make sense was on noah yeah you know oh, Noah's yeah. Ark was my first question what was like your first question the thing that got you on the journey of this actually doesn't make sense like what what, what was that question mm, it, that first the very first very elementary question came when i was about seven or eight uh at the end of each night you know, mom and dad would gather us together, read a public a religious publication, and then um, we'd say our prayers together. Mm-hmm. And then I had a question, and my question was, why aren't the dinosaurs in the Bible? Mm-hmm. And my mom and dad, they they didn't, you know, I don't, well, I've, obviously at seven, I didn't know how key of a question that was, and they mm-hmm. had no clue, and I'm going to give credit to my mom and dad where they just said, I don't know. Yeah. Because I, because with, even as a little kid, you, you, you're learning in school, you're learning about the fossil evidence when it comes to dinosaurs, you know, and all the different types of dinosaurs. So that's a major signpost of, of life on earth. So why is an absent, why is that in my mind, why is that absent from the in Bible? The Bible. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. That was, that was the first question and even when i branched that question out to others nobody really had an answer and that right. that kind of had me a myth because god's supposed to have all the answers all the answers that's what i was taught that's, that's what right I was, you know and and um is you know what's crazy about that because your first question was about dinosaurs right my first yeah. question was about noah and what happened to the dinosaurs because <laughs> i was oh, like okay I was like, Ma, did well, I asked my dad actually? I was like, Pop, did the dinosaurs fit on the ark? Because, like, yeah. look at I was at my I had my old book and everything. I was like, Poppy, look at this thing, you know, he's he's a big, ferocious monster. How's that gonna fit on the ark? Yeah. <laughs> right, so, right, that was exactly. yeah, yeah, that, that, was, that, that was, was my thing. Oh, yeah, one of the things when it came to the Noah story when I was a little kid. Uh, because I was born in the, in the late sixties and raised in the seventies and eighties, uh, is I'm trying to, okay. I just had it now. I just lost it. But anyway, yeah. One of my big things about the Noah story was how the earth was going to be repopulated. You know, I was like, well, you only got these few people and, but it was, it was a, distant question in my mind i never really verbalized it but mm. i was like you know hey uh i wonder how that's gonna work you know but it's god's loving spirit so what's gonna happen hallelujah you know yeah, yeah so, exactly 
and, and, and was... I, I just want to say for some for someone who grew up in the seventies and the eighties and born in the late sixties, like I really thought you was around my age, bro. Black really don't crack. <laughs> <laughs> Black really don't crack. Thank you, thank you. So thank if, you. if this is what I got, I got to look forward to, right here. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh yeah, he's the evil twin. He's the evil twin. Uh, okay. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll tell you what I'm. Fi- well, a lot of people in my family they have the they live for a long time. My uh, dad's 97 years old right now. Ah, uh, yeah. Yeah, my grandmother, she lived to be 99. I saw a picture of my great great grandfather at the time the picture was taken. He was uh, um, 106 years old. He was telling wow. his life story about being a slave. So that was oh, that wow. was interesting. And what else I'm finding interesting is like every other man in my generation is like really religious. My dad's really religious. I am not. But mm. the same thing, his dad, probably his dad wasn't very religious, mm. but his dad before that was religious. Oh, religious. So it's like, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like heathen preacher, heathen preacher, heathen preacher. Yeah. So. You, you hit uh, heathen, so that means probably your son will be, will be the, the right, preacher. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yes, exactly, exactly. So yeah, it's, it's funny how that works out. You, you know, and, and it's really interesting to to hear those things from uh from you know your parents and grandparents because I think um my my dad's dad because on my grandma's on my, my my dad's mom she was um a voodoo practitioner because she grew okay. up under like um. Like the Duvalier regime, and un- before oh, yeah. that, she grew up in a, in a time in Haiti where like black nationalism was a big thing. So people were yes. not following certain certain religions. You know, you feel what I'm saying? So, and they thought that they thought that Christianity was a white religion, so they stopped following it. So they grew up during that time. So my dad, okay. my my granddad was a voodoo practitioner, and my grandma were voodoo practitioners, but my dad wasn't. And now I'm a heathen again. So what's gonna happen yeah. with my son? <laughs> it's what it was gonna happen with my son. But yeah, my my granddad was born in uh, the 1920s, so he actually grew up under the occupation of. Oh, of he grew up under that. Yeah, so yeah, that's he, it. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, he saw um, that. My dad told me he was part of the protests and everything. It was it's pretty cool. The story of Haiti is always interesting. Every time I hear a new story about Haiti, it's incredibly interesting. Yo, you yeah, know, it's all, all, all them history. blacks, you know, all them Africans that raised up and, and said, we're not taking this no more, you know, yeah. and then yeah. because of that, how Haiti has suffered ever since then. Yeah, that's that's the thing. They always say that it's it. It's a it's a sad story because like um, propaganda works. Christian propaganda works very, very well, because even if I go into black churches and if the subject comes up, they will always say, oh, you know, Haiti just needs God again because they turned away from him when they made the deal with the devil. You know what I mean? Yeah. I will hear that a lot in black churches. I'm like, what do you mean by that? What, what, where did you hear that from? You know, and right. it was like, oh, you know, during during the, the revolts and everything like that. And I was like, okay, so are you saying it was better for us to be slaves then? <laughs> like, I don't, I don't be yeah, getting I've, what I'm saying. I've heard that response before. And every time I hear it, I'm like, what? Yeah, I, I don't get that. I don't get that at all. Now, as far as my religion, as far as my religious upbringing, mm-hmm. um, I was uh, born as a Jehovah's Witness. Oh wow! And, uh, yeah, yeah. So it was a kind of a strict upbringing, but mm-hmm. my parents were compared to other witness parents. My parents were a, a little bit more liberal. Mm-hmm. Um, but you know, at one point, yeah, I was when I was a, a kid, I was made to go up and knock on doors, and I hated that. I mean, I thought I was gonna run into because for me, it was a lot of shame that was involved. I didn't mm-hmm. feel like going up and knocking on somebody's door about their religion, you know, Bother even at that early t- right. I, even at the early time, I'm like, yeah, I don't. Why do I want to do that? I'm, I'm <laughs> what, what, for what? Um, but neither did my mom, so. Mm-hmm. Growing up, my mom, however she did it, she stayed home on Saturday mornings. So, mm-hmm. and then me and my brother were watching cartoons, and my dad, he was going out knocking on doors and so forth and so on. Um, but, but then I, I could go on and on with stories about the JWs. Um, yes, they're strict. Yes, you know, looking back in retrospect, 
Yeah, they're a cult. Mm-hmm. Um, they try to catch you off from family and friends. Uh, I never got baptized, though I had seriously considered it. Um, they tried to make them the organization the center of your life. Right. And looking back in retrospect, it's like, that's not how we people work. Mm-hmm. You know, I don't care if you're introverted or not. You know, we all have all these other little social groups that we're in, be them official or unofficial social social groups. Mm-hmm. Um, I, to me, it was even as a little kid, it was never a good fit for me. I always felt uncomfortable with it. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of don'ts, but not enough do's. Uh, my more or less rebellion with them started started kind of like in the preteens, because there were a couple kids that I used to play with across the street, and then one day my dad, trying to get me to associate with other Jehovah's Witness kids, said, "Well." Why are you associating with them? They're wicked, and they're going to be destroyed in Armageddon. Uh-huh. And I was like, but they're good people. You know, there were right. times where um, the oldest boy that I, at, there was like, what, three, three or four siblings, and two of the sons were closer to me and my brother's age. Uh-huh. And there were times where if there were like was a neighborhood bully around, they would stand up to that bully, especially if they were older than me, and said, hey, you're not going to mess with uh, Nathan over here. Uh, they they were just good people. Uh-huh. Parents were good people. And at that time, it was hard for me to reconcile how are they good people. And my mother's excuse was, um, well, we don't know what's going on in their house. Well, the police are never over there. You know, <laughs> yeah. you don't yeah, you don't hear any big ruckus going over there. You you see the mother making sure that their kids mind their manners and so forth and so on. So that I had a hard time reconciliating that. Um there's a whole lot of ego based in there too. A lot of ego. Uh you're not once you get so far in the religion. You're not supposed to ask any questions, uh, though. They would say, "Oh, yeah, you can ask some questions." Some questions. But once, mm-hmm. Right, but once, you, once you take the questions to a certain level, then no they're shutting down. Is. Yeah, they, they, you, you can't ask that. You just have to wait on Jehovah. And I'm just <laughs> like, why do I have to wait on that? I'm asking you. Mm-hmm. Aren't you supposed to be, you know, like this or that, this leader or that leader, whatever the case may be? Uh-huh. Um, it's very similar in mainstream Christianity. You could the answers are all forthcoming until you get to a certain part where you'd be like, "This seems like a contradiction," or "This seems very, very cruel for a God that says He's loving," and then all of a sudden, don't question God. Yeah, it does ex- exact. Don't question. He wants to kill, kill, kill. It's like I, 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 I didn't look. I definitely don't get it now, mm-hmm. and. Back then, there were just small voices in my mind that really hadn't pushed forward yet. That was that was asking those questions. Um, when it comes to education, uh-huh. you know, you're told that you should really seek God's kingdom and not the will of man. Uh-huh. And I'm thinking, but if you're, if a person takes the time to educate themselves. Because that person improved themselves, doesn't that mean it also improves the organization? Yeah, exactly. Uh, I I had a hard time understanding it. Now, fortunate for me, that's where my dad had a more liberal uh, ideas when it comes to education. My dad used to tell me about the times where some of the teachers kind of didn't push him the way he should have been pushed. Uh I don't know how much of integration my dad experienced back when he was growing up, uh-huh. but it left some scars. Edu- as he became older, education became important to him. Uh-huh. And 
he really did, though he didn't say it, he wasn't really believing on to what was coming from the Jehovah's Witness podium mm-hmm. about uh, continuing your education. Yet, when I was going to Columbus State, uh, I got on a radio commercial there. And, you know, and that was all cool. And all of a sudden, people at the hall heard me on the radio on this commercial. Mm-hmm. And then all I got was a lot of criticism. Your dad, your dad's an elder and blah, 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 blah. A lot of criticism. Wow. But there was one other person. I'll never forget him. You know, I said, well, these people over here criticized me. He took me off to the side. I said, I'm going to tell you something, man. You go ahead and continue your education. You know, they don't pay your bills, so forth, so on. You continue doing what you're doing. I think you're doing great work. And then that was about the best support that I had from the Kingdom Hall when it came to education. Um, they still, at one point in time after I left, they were like, oh, you can go to school. But then they did it on about faces. It all no. Forget no, that. don't go to school. You know, and the oh, the JWs are very, very interesting. My my fiance is an ex JW as well, and it's like okay, she she yeah she 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 told me all the time. She was like, yeah, it's very very cold. Like you know, and there, mm-hmm. there was a time when the the kingdom halls were were segregated, but then desegregation happened. Yeah. And yeah. but you know, you still have to go to the same kingdom hall with the people who would have probably lynched you 10, 10 years ago. So it's it's really right. it's a really interesting dynamic is 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 like you can still feel the because she said her kingdom hall was like that, you know, like it was the the olden days people were still there and our you know the, there are elders and their elders it's it was uh, <laughs> you know yeah that, so one of those that things def- are that definitely happens uh-huh. um it, it it's weird because there's this constant preaching about love your brother, love your sister, love, love, love. But yet when you look back at the history of the JWs, uh-huh. it's questionable when it comes to their thoughts on race. And then when you look at their leadership today, their governing body, as they call it, this is a worldwide religion that's almost on every continent. Yet, it's mostly European white men that are on the governing body and one black guy. Yeah, that's that's it. That's and it. it's like to me, you know, look again in retrospect, that doesn't make sense. Growing yeah. up, they were all white. Well, they're all white, yeah. Exactly. Mm. So it's 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 really a a Eurocentric um um religion. You know what I mean? So let um let me ask you because I've heard a, a lot with the especially when it comes when I've always asked people like um when you come out as someone who's, who's a, who's a non-believer, I know a lot of times for some families, it's a, it's, it's a shock, but I've seen more with, you know, these families that they'll cut yeah. people off, <laughs> you know, they'll completely yeah. cut people off, but our families, as far as anybody I'd ask, they, they don't really do that. Some people just like, Oh, whatever, do what you do. But with the JWs a little bit stricter, did you, cause I know there's a, there's a shunning thing that happens. Did that ever yeah. um ha- happen with uh with your family or do, were you all just non practicing or non committal or something like that and no one really cared? Well, my dad was definitely committed. There's no if or, if or ands about it. He became an elder when I was a little kid and is still an elder to this day. Uh-huh. Um, so we're talk. He's been an elder for over fifty years now. Um, he 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 was always looked up up on. He people looked up to him. Uh-huh. He was a very likable person. Um, and there were times where he was outspoken. Uh, so with the family in general, no. There were questions like, why am I not going out in field service? Why is my brother not going out? Why is it my mom? She went out, but not regularly. Uh-huh. But uh, there was one time they did a shepherding call on the family where a couple of elders came over to visit the family to gauge the the health of our spirituality wow. and i remember my mom just came out and said i don't like going out in field service and no and they didn't say not a no. not a thing <laughs> and i was like huh i'm gonna be all right then yeah. and then there was the question of well when am i gonna get baptized and i was like well i can consider it would you like to have a bible study sure i can at least have a bible study so i had a bible study that lasted over a year, but 
I never took the plunge uh, because something within me said, this is strange. This is weird. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, and then on, on top of that, it was, it was preached about that it's between you and Jehovah about your baptism. Mm -hmm. um, but yet, um, I remember there was this one brother that took me off to the side and said, you need to get baptized because your dad's an elder. Mm -hmm. And at the time, I was having my Bible study already. And I said, hold on, wait a minute here. Isn't that supposed to be between myself and Jehovah, Jehovah. not my dad? And then he really... It was almost like he was really, I don't want to say the word bully, but really trying to force me to get baptized, so forth and so on. Right. Later on, I learned how he forced his two teenage daughters to um, become baptized. Mm -hmm. uh, and even then, as I was in my mid to late teens, even then I was like, how are you going to push a teenager to commit all to the faith and they haven't had a chance to live life yet. Yeah. You know, yeah. um, and a teenager, as we all know, are going through these hormonal experiences that we've never felt before. And we're even more curious as to, Ooh, I have these urges now and so forth and so on. And they're strict about people fornicating and adultery they're really strict about that yeah um, and i was i was just like that how 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 is he gonna do that he th he threatened his teenage daughters from what i understand that if they don't get baptized they're out the house mm -hmm. so wow. i didn't under i was i was a little angry about that even mm. though it wasn't really my business, I was I was a little little tad bit upset about that. I'm like, no, it makes sense. Yeah. Later on, uh, one of the daughters got pregnant, so she got disfellowshipped, and the way he treated her was, from what I saw, was abhorrent. He treated mm. her like some stepchild. Um, like she was the dirt of the earth. Mm -hmm. Stepchild, stepchildren need love, and your teenage daughter, who's having a baby now, is probably a scared teenager, not knowing what's going to happen next. And you just compounded on the situation and not being a dad mm -hmm. and saying, "Hey, let me. We're gonna. The deed's done." There's nothing more we can do about it, but we're going to get through this together. If he had, he was an elder too, and had he stepped down to take care of his family, um, especially his teenage daughter that was now pregnant, I would have much respect for that. Much respect. Yeah. But he didn't do it. He was more, he was more focused on his status and his position. Status. And, and, and you know something that I, I've, I've noticed that too, because like I'm, I'm kind of working on something right now where um mm -hmm. re re how how I see how religious like impacts us or imp impacts us negatively in 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 several yeah. ways and one of the ways I was going to say is that a lot of times that's a potential to make you an abusive parent you know because right. your if the theology tells you that you have to parent this way and your child goes uh, against it like uh for example with when it comes to to JW's for example shunning mm -hmm. happens a lot so yeah. if you get if you get this fellow if a teenage person gets this fellowship like a teenager is still a kid they don't know anything right. and if their parent stops talking to them completely completely cuts off communication doesn't talk to them and only communicates with them just to feed them and does nothing else they should they show no love no compassion no type of you know communication with their child that could seriously damage children you know what i mean very like seriously damage them and seriously damage their development because a teenager is still developing you need your parents to guide you through some of these emotions and if you don't have that um from what, right. I'm, stud what I'm studying now in my courses is like that causes huge amount of like cognitive issues you know and it yeah. could even cause like ptsd and stuff like that like in permanent brain damage so it's it's like when uh and, and the thing is this doesn't only happen within the jw sphere you know what i mean even outside no. of, 
Yeah, happens even outside of the Mormons. Protestants. Exactly. All the that. Mormons happens to and Protestant Christianity, especially evangelicals. That yes. happens. To, yeah, I mean it within within like Protestant Christianity with amongst black people, sometimes that mm -hmm. can happen, especially if the child is part of the LGBT community. Yeah, I mean, so it's that happens a lot and it it really has a potential to to make you abusive towards uh towards children. And I, I see that a lot, you know what I mean? And I think that's one of the reasons why, like as black folks, we need to start, if you're not going to not leave it, then decolonize religion. You know what I mean? Yeah. Because like we, a lot of things, a lot of this that we learned comes not from us. It comes from Eurocentric ideologies. It doesn't come from us. Right. We learned right. all this through them. A lot of people would say, you know, Christianity or Islam was it was in Africa before it got to Europe or whatever. At the end of the day, the theology, the power, the the central governing bodies, they're all in Europe. <laughs> you know, yeah. they all came from Europe. Every theology that, that we have right now came from Europe. You know what I mean? All yeah. of it. So it's yeah. it's like it's not ours. Even if it started in Africa, it's not ours anymore. It's theirs. We need to decolonize it if you're going to be part of it. That's what I've, I've always right. said. Well, to back up a point that you just made about abuse and all that, um, so of course I'll be keeping names out of it so I can, so that way I can really say a little bit more. Um, the oldest daughter was pressured, you know, she wanted to be with her sister, but she was pressured not to be to be against a daughter mm. and that something happened and that and that family all of a sudden they were they disappeared for a long time mm -hmm. but what i found out uh is that possibly the oldest girl uh attempted suicide mm -hmm. and um i had now i had a brief conversation with her years ago and she, she only told me just a tiny bit. And she told, you know, she told me the part about how her dad really put pressure on her to have a division between her and her sister. It's like either pick your sister's side or pick our side. Mm -hmm. And it's like you, all, all of you live under the same roof. What are you doing? Um, and that, of course, made me lose more respect for the man. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't like that at all. You're supposed to be the elder, the leader, and it teaches that you're supposed to take care of your family first and foremost, and you're doing the exact opposite. Yeah. Um, I think that if statistics were ever kept on the JWs in terms of depression and suicide, it would be very damning for them. Mm -hmm. um, there was somebody else. This happened probably about, um, it's been a while, maybe 10 years ago, maybe a little bit more, where someone who I grew up with in the hall, she did commit suicide. Wow. Um, and there were a lot of stressors going on there that I that I uh, became aware of. Uh, then one girl I knew, she was disfellowshipped at the time, but I asked her, I said, well, what happened? She was like, well, I don't know much, but called my mom up. So I called her mom up. And then her mom was said to me, she just lost Jehovah's spirit. I was like, what? <laughs> what does that mean? What? Right. <laughs> so to prove my point to the sister, I said, I told her that was highly offensive. Uh -huh. I said, so somebody's just going to lose the spirit of Jehovah. And though he loves them, he's just going to leave somebody alone that's in that type of deep dark depression that's crazy to me yeah that was absolutely crazy and so i kind of i went in and then i then i kind of left it kind of positive like you could be the next person that could spot the care uh, the characteristics of someone that could commit suicide and maybe you could be part of saving the life if you just empowered yourself to understand the signs because uh -huh. sometimes people that really want to commit suicide, they're the ones that aren't going to say much. Yeah. They're just, they're going to just do it. Be done and do it. They might leave a letter. They might make a phone call. But by the time they made their phone call, they've, they're someplace where they're getting ready to do it now. Um, and it's a shame. Most of the kids that I grew up with in the hall 
most of them don't even go go anymore. Yeah, um, yeah. Like, religion is on a massive decline. Yeah, I mean because it's it's yeah. like they when I was when I was first on social media because you know I grew up. I became a young adult during a time when social media became a thing. You know what I mean? I graduated yeah. high school in 2005. So, and Facebook came out in 2004, you know? So it's like, I, I, and you know, and then YouTube came out in 2006, you know? Yeah. So like, these, uh, these major social media platforms came out when I became a young adult. And the first thing that was said on all these websites from YouTube to Reddit, to Facebook, Twitter, all of them, they all said the internet is where religion goes to die. And yeah. that's what I actually saw, <laughs> you know, that I've, I've actually experienced that because I was like the first time I was actually able to speak to other people who weren't of my same ideology or, my, or weren't of my same religion. They were actually able to show me, you know, all these flaws that I noticed, but I put in the back of my head. But then it showed me more flaws that I didn't see before, you know, and yeah. it's it, it really is true. It's where religion goes to die. And with the young people right now, with, Ooh. you know, everything being right here <laughs> everything is literally right there yeah it's gonna it let you say that because today i think it was on this channel or another channel that you may know of i forget the name of the channel now but i'm pretty sure it was uh something along this one where these young folks are having these atheists were having conversations with uh christians mm -hmm. about religion and so forth and it was amazing to hear everybody talk and the knowledge that was there. That was that was just amazing. You know, they're going, well, these stories are were actually inspired by this other story over here, so forth and so on. They were very good with their with the information that they had. Mm -hmm. Very good. And in my opinion, the Christians really didn't have much to stand on because I think they didn't understand rules of evidence. They certainly didn't understand how uh, DNA works and all that good stuff. Uh -huh. um, they did. They didn't know any of the stories about saviors and stuff like that that predate Christianity. Um, yeah. They knew, and, but the atheists they were on it. They even had a Satanist in there too. I was mm -hmm. like, whoa, okay, yeah, really. all right. That, that probably was this channel, yeah. You know, because uh, that that that's what, what what we do over on TikTok. We we host yeah. panel things and everything like that, and we get we get Christians to talk to each other, and you, you know it's uh, it's uh, it it gets deep. It gets uh, it gets really really interesting. I have some on my own yeah. channel. I was gonna upload as well of my okay. own um, debate that, that that I do, my own panel, my own discussion, and that's what we that's what that's what I like to do. I like to discuss with people and ask them what they believe and why, and give me a good reason to see what why they believe it. Yeah, you, know, you know, so um. And, and we need more more discussions like that. We do, and it's and like, like to borrow from kind of a celebrity, uh, I forget his name, and he's on the Breakfast Club. He was like, "I prefer a conversation over confrontation." I used to confront people a lot, though, but that's yeah, all because yeah. Of my yeah, that was all because of my JW upbringing. I just mm -hmm. kind of follow some of it, just follow me into my journey into atheism. Mm -hmm. um, but now yeah, it's like now, yeah. yeah. You see, with me, I was very, very confrontational, and I think it's because, like, I went through like an angry atheist stage, <laughs> you know, yeah. because I felt yep. lied to, you know, I felt yeah. lied to, so it's like I was upset. I was upset yep. at everybody, but um, I was able to to get over that, and just like how you said, have more conversations than a huge confrontation. Now, I don't mind confrontation. I don't look for smoke, but I ain't ducking it though. <laughs> no, know? I ain't ducking it. No, I ain't ducking I, it. I don't look for it, but I ain't ducking it. Having those discussions are, are very intriguing. I think what's more interesting is not the destination, but the journey on how they got to their destination. That's interesting to me. That's gold. Yeah. Um, and that's Same. it's it's I think it's rewarding to, to have those type of conversations. Um, when I left the JWs, I was more or less if you left the JWs back when I left, or as I faded out, as they call it, which was back in the uh, early 90s. You're kind of like on your own. Sure, you'd run into people here and there, you'd have conversations. But before the internet, you know, you were on your own, reading books, so forth and so on, going to the library, whatever the case may be. Um, and then um, when I started talking to other people about faith and all, you know, I remember I talked to a friend of mine about sin. And she was like, well, maybe sin isn't really sin. Maybe it's this or that. Sometimes it's just all in how you look at it. I forget her exact words to me, but it felt very empowering to me. 
Um, the final nail on the casket for me for religion was the story of how God sent in the poisonous snakes to bite the Israelites. I forget the reason why. They did something again. They were crying. And yeah, yeah. And um, God sent in the venomous snakes to bite them. And they all, you know, became ill and started to die. But yet God instructed them or instructed, was it Aaron or Moses, to make this stake with a snake going up on the stake. Huh. So in other words, you're, you're now instructing your Israelites, your chosen people, to worship an image. Yeah. I don't yeah. understand that. Why don't I understand that? I always count on people to be who they are. It's never let me down. Uh -huh. The Israelites would worship a, a false, quote, false god, an idol, at the drop of a hat for almost anything. For example, the golden calf. They uh -huh. made the golden calf. They worshiped it. Moses got mad. God got mad. Blah, 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 blah. Now, here it is, knowing the history of the Israelites, now you're going to make this image so they could be suddenly cured? <laughs> if they're going to be cured miraculously just by gazing upon an image, aren't they going to want to worship that image? Oh, Especially yeah. in those times when science was almost nothing. Uh -huh. So, yet it doesn't say in the Bible how all of a sudden these people started worshiping snakes and stuff like that. But if that's what they did with the golden calf, why aren't they doing it with this other image that now they're being cured by? Yeah. That didn't make sense to me. You know, today we do have these extreme Christian groups where they do worship snakes. Mm -hmm. And like, they get they have snake handlers and stuff like that. Yeah, they get the there's this I forget where it's at. They got this one group where they handle rattlesnakes and uh -huh. a couple of leaders have gotten bitten and died from them and they're doing uh -huh. crazy stuff with them. And this is thousands of years later. Thousands, a few thousand years, yeah, a few thousand years later. Uh -huh. Well, I'm sure if that really happened, that's exactly what those Israelites are going to be doing. But nope, no mention of it, just, oh, you're cured. And that was it. Case closed. Blah. Final nail yeah. in the coffin for me. It's like, yo, this is a very highly superstitious culture. You know what I mean? Like, if we went yeah. back there and says and say that our skin is like this because we saw the face of God, they would have believed us. You know, you know okay. what I mean? It's like, it's, oh, yeah. it, it's a very superstitious culture. So the thing is, like, it, when, when, when I thought about it, I was like, yo, isn't all this, isn't, isn't all this just magic? Because I was, I was right. thinking about it, I was like, yo, isn't like Jesus' sacrifice just blood magic? Because right. he was a, a sacrifice on a cross of blood and he was the the lamb and I'm like he was the right. final lamb I'm like y'all this was just a, a blood magic sacrifice wasn't it <laughs> you yeah. know because it all seems strange. you know on um, one thing about all these uh when when i i i, I forget now there was the next question i want to ask you i figured when um a lot of when my religious opinions changed and i started really questioning all these things a lot of my social positions also changed because, like, you know, growing up in a very, uh, you know, West Indian culture, it's very, very patriarchal, very, very chauvinistic, very yes. homophobic, <laughs> you know, yes. very homophobic. So when I, oh, you mentioned misogynistic. Misogynistic yeah. as well. Very, oh, yeah. We're, we're, we're very misogynistic. So when I started um, really questioning a, a, a lot of these things, a lot of my social political beliefs also started going into question as well. Was that the, the the same thing for you, or did you always have like a so like a more progressive and more conservative view in, in your social political views? They were more conservative. They were, were more definitely more conservative, more conservative, more ego driven. Mm -hmm. um, I back my I, compared to the Jehovah's Witnesses, I always felt that I had a more liberal view. Of, oh yeah, same. Um, of women, but I still had my issues. Um, mm -hmm. As far as people from the L LBQT plus community, I hope I said that right because I don't want to offend anybody. Mm -hmm. But the but the from that community, 
Um, I definitely had issues. It was all religion, you know, man, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. I remember one time as a little kid, me and this other little kid were talking about race and homosexuality. And I said, I forget what I said, but my dad was listening. He heard it all and he called me in and he said, well, you know, you really should learn to accept people for who they are because they can be very loving, so forth and so on, no matter who they are. Looking back, I have to often wonder uh, if my dad knew someone or someone in the family that may have been in, in the community uh, and my dad, my dad was trying to teach me some empathy. I mm. wonder because he didn't, he never came hardcore uh, about the LBQT community. If, if I'm saying it wrong, please correct me. Oh, L um, LGBTQ community. LGBTQ community. Yeah, he, he never came really hard. I knew other brothers in the hall that did. They yeah. were like, hey, you know, blah, blah, blah. They sit next uh, to me. I'm fighting to them and all, all this other stuff. Yeah, yeah. exactly. But then um, um, my my own revelation, a release from that, I was examining my own value system because I, I wasn't too much... It was maybe a year or two after that when I was examining other, some other parts of my value systems. And I said, wait a minute. You know what? People should be happy with whoever they want to be. Exactly. Um, I They live their life. I live my life. What they do has no bearing on what I do uh -huh. at all. If they are good people that want to contribute to the common good, so be it. Be happy. Yeah. Do what you do. Um, and, and that was when I realized that I, it, it was like a release, like, man, I feel better now. You know, I, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not demonizing a whole group of people. You know, yeah, I, you, you, you know how, you know, that, that saying it takes more muscles to frown than to smile. Like it's, yeah. it's really true because you hold all that stuff in and it's like, yo, I was holding all this tension in for these people. And once I let it go, I'm like. Well, I, I feel I feel way better. Like there's there's yeah. there, there's you know reason to feel tension for for those people anymore. And it's like it's when I look back on, I was like, I, wow, I, I really believed in ridiculous things about these people for no reason. <laughs> you know, yeah. it was really no reason, only because I was just told that from one line in the in the Bible. But I think even back then, mm -hmm. um, even back then when I thought that it was quote unquote wrong if, and I thought they were quote unquote going to hell, I really had a problem with treating them a certain way. You yeah, know what I mean, but I did hold a, a certain like avarice for them. Like I, I didn't want to be around yeah. them. I did, I did agree yeah. that was uh, is was I was, they were treating them wrong was was a bad thing. But it was it was like if they do get treated wrong, I didn't care because I think deep down yeah. I thought that they deserved it for some reason. You see what I'm saying? Yep. So yep. that's uh, that was that was a thing. But you know, oh, now it's like love who you love. My bad. Go ahead. Uh, my first experience with a gay man. I was on the city bus with my grandma. It was my, me and my grandma and my brother. And my grandma started talking. He was, I forget the term we used, maybe a little bit. He had crawl, almost crossed for a cross-dresser, almost. Mm -hmm. But, you know, he, he talked a certain way, so forth and so on. And me and my brother like, he's gay. <laughs> it was our first experience. Mm -hmm. And my grandma was just talking to him like it was nothing. Nothing. Mm -hmm. uh, and then he got off the bus. And then I was like, Grandma, you were talking to a homosexual. Huh. And my grandma looked at me like, what do I care? I don't, yeah. I don't care. She didn't really, I, she really didn't say much about it. And growing up and, you know, because I adored my grandparents. Um, they never really said anything about anyone that might be gay or something like that. You know, they were just like, whatever. Hmm. And then that was that. Uh, so that was my first experience with someone from that community. And he was he was a nice guy. Nobody would talk to him on that bus. Everybody was giving him the cold shoulder, giving him the side eye. Mm -hmm. And but my grandma was talking to him and just being a human to him. Mm -hmm. And looking back, I, I, I thought that was. My grandma, it seemed like my grandma was like to lead by example. And she mm -hmm. really set a good example when it came to that. She was, she was really good. 
Um, that's wonderful. It, yeah, it was. It was. It was a great experience that she was trying to teach me and my brother. Um, that's yeah, I wanted to, uh, to ask you a uh, next question. You know, on the topic of of love, of course. Um, mm -hmm. when I've asked other black male atheists about this, you know, in our community, we love us some Jesus, and yeah. women mm -hmm. of our community also love us some Jesus. So this makes it very hard to date sometimes, <laughs> you know, because oh, yeah. uh, when whenever when I was out in the field, you know, before I met my fiance, thank goodness I met her because. Dating is so ghetto nowadays, but thank yeah. goodness I'm better. But Very like, hard. oh God, it's bad. But when uh, I was on the field, a lot of issues that I want to run into is like, either within the relationship, it will become a problem when they find out that I am I'm not I'm not a believer, or so what I started was I just started telling them outright before we start. But then I'll get to the point where I'll, I'll hear, oh, you know, well we can't do anything serious, but come over every Saturday or after church on Sunday, you know, and it starts to make me feel used, you know, cause like at the end, I'm a human. I want long time compatibility. You know, that's, that's what I want for my life one day, but, but they want the meats. Yeah, exactly. They just want the meat. <laughs> so I would rather run into that problem or I'll run into the problem that I call booty gospel, where they would oh, try yeah? to convince yeah. me to go into the church by, you know, just giving it up for me on Saturdays and inviting me on Sunday you know what I mean? But when you invite me on sun on Sunday, you're wearing some skin tight jeans to church and some heels. Hmm. Yeah. I, <laughs> so yeah, like you, you I, I, I come on, sis. I know what you're doing. <laughs> I know right. what you do. So uh did you ever um, run into that? Because I know around probably the 90s it yes. was probably worse. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Um there's uh, exactly how you described it. That's exactly what I've experienced. Mm. Um, you know, oh, you got to come to church with me, so forth and so on. And especially as I started to move more toward non belief, mm. you know, it's like, oh, you're, I don't know about this. I'm not interested in going to a church. Well, you know, if you want to have me, you got to go to church. And I'm just mm -hmm. like, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. today, today, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a single guy today. Um, if I were to be in a committed relationship with uh, someone that goes to church, it would have to be someone who goes infrequently, someone mm -hmm. that may have their own doubts, like, yeah, mm -hmm. you, you know, or they made their own point. Um, like a lukewarm. A yeah. A, a, someone who regularly goes, we ain't going to make it. <laughs> we, we, we just ain't going to make it. Let, let's get it up in front now because if you're the holy roller you go to church a minimum of once a week to three or four times a week we ain't gonna make it plain and simple because um, i ain't going with you because i don't care mm -hmm. no exactly because i one i'm gonna be uncomfortable number mm -hmm. two i'm not gonna believe shit and you're gonna be up here like nah, <laughs> nah, uh uh no nah. and then i'm gonna be like what has your Jesus done for me? What has he done? Our people have been through generations of nothing but pain and suffering, but Jesus never came. We were yeah. taught the gospel by with the Bible and the whip and all these other brainwashing techniques. Did uh -huh. Jesus ever deliver us? No. Where was he? And, um, and, you, and you know something? I think you know those type of arguments and discussions I have with my sisters is what made me is what made me realize that I can't probably date a holy roller because you know there'll be times where I'll be sitting in church and I'm sitting here playing Candy Crush on my phone. You know, what I mean the the pastor's preaching, everybody like, "Amen." I'm sitting here playing, you know, what I mean, like I'm on my phone like this, playing words with friends. Right. <laughs> you know? And then and then my sisters would get mad at me when I when we get home, like, "Oh, you were disrespected the church." I'm like, "Yeah, I don't care about." I don't, really know that shit. I don't care about that shit. Like, I don't care. <laughs> you know, me, and then, oh my, go ahead. for me, if I'm in the church and I'm a non-believer, I'm going to be like, it's, it's going to be very apparent to everybody because I'm going to be doing the eye roll. The, the what? You mm. know, because sometimes, sometimes my facial expressions can just give me right away, mm. you know, and I'm going to be like, whatever. Or I'm going to be like this. You know, yeah. uh, snoring loud, you know, <laughs> and 
And uh, now if it's a special event or something like that, like here, you know, if I'm with someone and they're and they go in frequently, um, they're like, well, hey, this is going to be a special time for me and my family. I really like it if you attend. I know you don't, you know, I know you don't get into that, but I just, you know, would you be there for me? I'd be cool. I could do that. I'd be cool. Yeah, yeah. I, could do that. I mean, well, I, I fact, still. Yeah. Yeah, matter of fact, I, like in uh in in Haitian tradition, on every New Year's Day, um, that's our Independence Day as well. So we we celebrate by by eating a certain type of special special soup. You know what I mean? Yeah. So like in that that soup, soup has, yeah, uh, jumu, um, soup jumu. So we okay, uh, okay. basically a squash soup because during okay. slavery times the the masters didn't let us eat the squash because squash was particularly for them. So when yeah. we got our independence and burned down all the plantations, we took the squash. You know, so like basically eating squash soup is a symbol of independence for us. You know what I mean? Oh. Um, now, in uh, in Haitian culture, the, the people who make most of the soup is guess what? In the church. So on January first okay. or on December thirty first to January first, guess where I'm going? I'm going to the church. I'm be sitting in the back. I'm just, I'm be, I'm be talking to the young kids about life and yeah. stuff like that, which is what I do every single year now. That's when that's when okay. they see. Me. That's when the, the the youth, the new youth of the church. That's when they whenever they see me, they, they always see me. On January thirty first, because they know I'm gonna come to them with life lessons and everything like that. I'm like the old wise uncle, basically, you know. So yeah. that's what I do now. That's my that's my tradition. But that's what I. That's really the only time you'll see me at church, or if someone that I grew up with is mm -hmm. back at the church and I haven't seen them in like five, six, seven years, I'll go back to the church to speak with them. You know, what I mean, that's what I'll do. And I already know me and my my fiance's wedding is gonna be. Probably, and if not in the church, then, then you know my pastor will marry us and everything like that. Cause uh, yeah. it's just it's just tradition. My my older sister got married through that pastor. My dad got married through that pastor. Several of my cousins got married through that same pastor because we all went to the same church. So I already mm -hmm. know I'm gonna get married through the same pastor. It's it's fine. Oh, that's so that's good. what I'll do. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's what I'll do the religious stuff for. But if they tell me, you know, are you gonna come on Sunday? I'm like, no, nah, I'm not coming. <laughs> I don't believe in this shit anymore. So I'm like, I ain't coming. You know what I mean? And that and that's what I always say. It's fine. To, I always tell people this. It's good for you, right? It's good for you. If you yeah. ever tell me that that you need this because it keeps you in line, it keeps you moral, and one day you tell me that I'm not believing anymore, I will take you to church myself because you obviously need that, but I don't need it. Right. That's right. All people. Right. You know, I don't need a church or a kingdom hall. To help me be a good person, mm -hmm. I, I I just don't. I one of the ways that I can be or how I can find myself to be a good person, science and understanding how existence works. Uh, we like one of the things that just astounds me is when we look at the world of the very small, the very small. How all we have all these particles that come in and out of existence so fast. That you could barely, you would barely know that they were there, but we know they were there because of the evidence that they leave. Mm -hmm. um, Carl Sagan's "The Pale Blue Dot." Um, Love that folks, quote. Ex oh my goodness, folks that aren't familiar with that, Google it. It is amazing because when you see this one pale blue dot hung upon the background of the universe. And you read that quote by Carl Sagan, for me, that is a very humbling experience. We live on this little rock formation uh -huh. in the universe, and we're incredibly insignificant compared to the universe. Sure, we can might do a couple neat tricks and so forth and pat ourselves on the back for it, but compared to the universe, we are tiny. We ain't shit. We ain't <laughs> shit. Nothing. When you look at, when you compare our Earth to the size of the other planets or to the size of the sun and understand that 99% of the matter that's in our solar system is made up of the sun. But yet when you, when you uh, journey further out into the universe, you have stars that would dwarf our own stars like Betelgeuse. Yeah. Beetle, uh, yeah. it's, it's, it's amazing to me to learn why be animals behave the way they do? Uh, how light is emitted into this car, and how 
the, 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 the light protons that came here, it took to leave the surface of the sun, it took eight minutes. And mm -hmm. to understand the distances of eight minutes, the sun is roughly what? 93 million, on average, 93 million miles away from us. Just about. Yet, yet, yet light, if I were to emit light to you in some kind of a way, it's going to get there almost instantaneously. Mm -hmm. But to say that light takes eight minutes to get there, and then we go further out, the closest solar system to us, I believe, is four light years away. Four light years away. Mm -hmm. Exactly. To imagine, to try to imagine the distance that that covers, it's mind-blowing. My, it's completely mind blowing, and and the thing is, I was really into I was really into space science as a kid. I was still into space science a lot, and when mm -hmm. I realized just how distant things are, I was like, "Yo, Voyager One is the is the is the farthest thing to us right now." That's right. It it technically still has not left our solar system. Technically, it hasn't hit the Kuiper Belt yet. Well, because after isn't the it, 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 medium right? No, it's it's left. It's now officially left. Mm -hmm. Both of them now have now officially left. I forget the date that they left. We're on the seventh. First, oh no, no, they. It was just a few years ago that they both left the solar system. Right, right, right. Um, right, right, right. but yes, you're right. They, they, they were launched in the late seventies. I remember that. Mm -hmm. Oh man, I remember that because it got, it got on television, you know, and they. I remember watching the clock news, Walter Conkrite. Uh, and we're seeing this, and we're like, hey, this these ships are going to give us information about our our nearest neighbors, the the Saturn and Jupiter. Huh? And there was a big to do. Then the mid '80s came, and then Voyager One and Voyager Two got to their destinations. We started getting back all this information. Like at that time, it was thought that Saturn only had three rings, and they were major rings big rings. Mm -hmm. Now that the boards have gotten there, now we know that Jupiter has thousands upon thousands of rings, if, if I remember correctly. But mm -hmm. they have all yeah. these different rings. And it's incredible to me. Uh, the information that's come back about Jupiter, we didn't know all this. Now, fast forward to today, we know even more. No and it's more. astounding to me. It's astounding to me. And to think that someday, who's coming up behind me? Someday, all oh, their sightseeing. Someday, uh, I don't know if it'll happen in our lifetime. I would love it if it would, but we could actually journey to these planets to observe them. I think that would be incredible. That would be amazing. Yeah. They're actually planning that the, the, the Europa Clipper is going to go to one of the moons of yes. Jupiter. And I don't think it's going to land, but it's going to examine. It's going to actually, actually like, you know, orbit it, orbit Europa. Mm -hmm. And um, I think a few years after that, they're going to land one to see if they can get through the ice, through the through the right. Yeah, yeah, I, I heard about that program too. Yeah, it's gonna happen in twenty thirty five, I, I think, and that that'll be that'll be incredible because if we can actually um, confirm that there's life on Europa, that would be amazing. We will know that there's life other than us, even if it's if even if it's like crab or just a bacteria. You know, what I mean, if it's a bacteria or a crab. There's life outside of us. <laughs> you know what I mean? Right. That would now change it's confirmed. So many things. Now it's confirmed. That would change so many things about, about the way that we think about life. You know what I mean? Now we know. Now we will know, like, confirmation, case proof that water, yes, water is a necessary component of life. At least liquid. At least some sort of yeah. liquid is a necessary component of, uh, of life. And it doesn't have to be warm or lightning or anything like that. We can You can form it. And you know, heating heated heat vents that would be amazing. Uh, I will I would love to see that. I think we're gonna go yes. to Titan, you know, one of one of okay. Saturn's moon Titan. I think we're gonna go there in like yes. 2050. I'm probably gonna be yes. old ass man by that time. I'm probably gonna be like in my 60s or 70s by 2050. Yeah, so I'm gonna do my do best to be there too. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you know what? With uh, with medical technology the way it was going nowadays, they said and with medical technology nowadays, um, our generation is gonna live to see 150. We're gonna see 150, you know what I mean? So the way medical technology is going nowadays, you'll probably see it. Because I want to see the year 2100. I want to see it. Back in the 90s, we knew that was gonna happen because I remember when Clinton came on TV and said, Hey, we're making these amazing discoveries, and kids that are born now will probably live to be 150 to 200 years old. 
but I think that medical science will progress even faster than what it is today. And right. it's going to be amazing with AI coming, with quantum computing coming. There are going to be a lot of great discoveries that are going to be that are going to be made that can help us. But I'll mention this. We do want to be concerned about who can afford to have these procedures. If we are to take seriously the doctor's Hippocratic Oath, we need to have discussions about how we're going to disseminate these new technologies to help what cures us. I, I personally, I don't want to see where, set, where we have something where only the rich can have access to. Why? We could have, we could be helping the next great scientist or the person with the next great idea to be cured then and society can reap Im the immense rewards from that. Unfortunately, there are some circles that may feel that, oh, no, no, we're going to be selective. You know, more of the, be it that it's um, social economic, race, so forth, so on. We really need to have these discussions now because it's coming. It's I think there's a lot of discussions we need to have on the emerging technologies that we have. Mm -hmm. We have Moore's Law today where computing power can double itself in 18 months. That's going out the window. That may even be out the window now. Yeah. What it's going to reach a point where what the change that it took in 18 months will happen in a, in a month or maybe in just a week. We mm -hmm. got to be ready, ready for and us, us people of color. I really think that we need to be very up on this. We've been left out on so much in the past. And we have opportunities to catch up through education, so forth and so on mentoring so forth and so on which is great it's great to see that but what's coming down the pipeline we all need to become familiar with it and be able to take advantage of it yeah um i mean people look like us black people we're we're, we're so talented we could be at the forefront of all this stuff oh, it's just like our the governments that we have around the world are just they're so short-sighted because they only see yes. you know the dollars in front of them very short. It's right. the same thing that's happening in my country. It's like it's the leadership is extremely short sighted. They only see, you know, I'm going to get 50 million dollars to do this and basically they'll do it. And that's it. And that's all they care about. Right. You know what I mean? So it's it's that's what short sightedness is that what we need to get rid of. But as we get older, I, th I think as these people die off and millennials start to take over and Gen Z starts to take over, we'll see a lot of a, a lot of shifts. We'll see a lot of them. A lot of them do that. We could. This is where I have my hope. Back when we had the BLM protests mm -hmm. and, you know, I drive for Uber on the side uh, and I'm picking up these white kids that went to go protest. What I heard, it wasn't just like what we saw back in the 60s, you know, or the 50s where there's like a sprinkle of allies. I mean, I'm picking up a bunch of white kids and they are articulating to me why they are protesting. I've never seen anything like that, much less Columbus. Mm -hmm. I, I, you know, so I'm very interested in those kids that I pick up. Where are they going to be in society in the next 10, 20, and 30 years? Yeah, I want to see it. Yeah, I want to see it. I'm, I'm really inter interested because at the level that I saw these white kids protesting, I'm like, whoa, and then this one girl that I knew, she was telling me that, you know, when the police were trying to get them to disperse, the white kids got in, got in between the cops and the black folks and they held hands and said, you got to get to us. You got to get to us first to, before you can get to them. I was like, well, they did what? <laughs> yeah. I was like, yeah. oh, explain to the me, kid. They did what? <laughs> You know, I'm used to us, you know, being what we are, what happened uh, in Philadelphia with the Black Panthers, stuff like that. Uh, I mean, I'm used to that. You know, it's yeah. like we on yeah, our own. Well, yeah, we we on our own. We might have a couple allies here and there, but that's it. But what I saw in 2020, woo! Incredible. It was incredible. So I, I have a little bit of hope there. Mm. But yeah, so, same. 
it, it, sometimes I have to, when I hear a lot of negativity coming from the extreme right, you know, there's a, one of my Uber riders said, sometimes the people that have these minority voices, they're the ones that shout the loudest. So we'll see what happens, but they can shout the loudest, making it look like they have control or some sort of influence. But we'll see what's, what's going to happen. I'm not cool. holding my breath. <laughs> We've seen this before, yeah. So it's like yes. I don't hold my breath, but it's like yes, we'll what, exactly. What we'll Especially see what happens. when I see black folks go for, let's say, well, Putin said this back in twenty. Like I heard blacks. Well, if we had Putin and all, or like Putin, what? Um, it's mm -hmm. like, oh, so you're telling me that you're gonna lay behold on yet another white man to come save us? Come on, y'all. Come on. Yeah. <laughs> Come um, on. That's what happened. Right. Exactly. That's we got to do this for our own. As far as controversy that's going on with DEI and stuff like that, it is. I think it's important that we do our homework on DEI so we know it full. You know, know it backwards and forwards, because I've seen us kind of fall prey to that nationalist idea that black folks can't do shit, that we're lazy, we're incompetent, so forth and so on. No, prove, when we can articulate the better point on why their ideas are just damaging all the way around, we have to make better arguments because they're going to be here for a while. Problems aren't going away. They're, not. they're going to be here for a while. We have great examples of people that are stars of racism like Hitler. Hitler's been dead for years, but he sure does influence some folks these days to he this does. day. We still have the, the, the Richard Taylors and the um, yes. the Stephen Crowders and the Nick yes. Winters and the Ben yes. Shapiro's. Yeah, I mean, we, yes. we still have those. And people are going to be mad at me for, for saying that because Ben Shapiro is Jewish, but don't tell me that you're not influenced by him, bro. <laughs> like, this is, right, oh, right. Like, you, you have the same type of ideology. The only, the, only, the only thing that you could... I'm not even going to get into that because it's, it's racial politics, but... It is, and Ben Shapiro is... He's good at it because it's he will offer this argument... Where they'll be, yeah, he, he, that's right, that's right. But he'll slip in like this half truth or an assumption and make it appear like a fact. He's, he's real good at that. He's real a good, good grifter. I found. Yeah, yeah. Him, him, and, him and Candace Owens, they're extremely good grifters because they, they, they learn. They learn that in order to, to grip somebody, you have to give some true things, connect a half, just like you said, say one, say, um, true thing one, true thing two. The third thing you say is a half truth. But your conclusion is a lie. But because right. you said two true things, you already primed your audience to thinking that your conclusion is true. And it's not. Right. You know, I recently, I, I, I recently saw that interview of Candace Owens had on The Breakfast Club. Mm -hmm. And it was an interesting interview. I'm like, she has a point here, a point there. You know, I, I want to hear out. I don't want to hear somebody's what they think it is. I want to hear it for myself and make my own call on it. And I'm like, oh, she makes a good points here and there. But at the same, there were some questions that they didn't really ask in that interview. Uh, they rose up some, some a couple hard questions for. Uh, but I would have, I would have gone a little bit more hardcore on her. No, you know, still kept a conversational tone because I, I you, you, because it was a conversational tone. They drew a lot out of her, a mm. lot out of her. You know, now you ask some harder questions. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that's exactly, exactly what I would have done. I would ask her some, some way harder questions. I would have asked the same question to you. I asked her, when was America great for black people? Yeah, I mean, you can't right. really name the time. The only thing the only thing you can do is do a rigmarole of, oh, after this happened and we were getting better. Nah, the question is, when was America good for black people? If you're going to say that it's now, you need to explain how. Yeah, I mean, so it's, it's like, it's because it's not good now. We still have issues with police brutality we still have issues with yes. the red line we still have issues with yes. um discrimination all throughout employment and the health system so how is it good you know, you know what i mean like it's what that's that's a question i've always asked a black person who's who's black and maga 
when was America good for black people? Right. Always. You know what I mean? Because it wasn't good before the 60s. It wasn't good after the 60s. You know, and it's not right. good now. So yeah, we've made wrong. some. Yeah, I think we've made some progress, but there's a whole lot more progress we need to make. Exactly. Uh, Rick, I remember in my Uber uh, adventures, uh, especially mm-hmm. around 2020, I picked up a lot of um, underwriters, home underwriters. These are white folks. We're just having a conversation. You know, I told them how one time I got into real estate, you know, doing a little flip here and there, renting. And um, um, they told me right out, they said, Nate, be careful because redlining is still going on. Mm. And it's still going on here in the north, here in Ohio, here in Columbus. It still goes on. So it definitely have, still goes on. Yeah, it definitely still goes on. Um, so we have to be mindful of that and, and know if we're going to get into real estate, stuff like that, you know your business. So that yeah. way you can quickly identify if somebody's bullshitting you. Exactly. Um, and in my opinion, I think we should learn to study as many economic systems as we can. We know the failings of capitalism. Um, what are we going to do to take? Nothing's going to be given to us. It, it never will. They may make some friendly gestures, but nothing's gonna ever be just given to us. You we have take to, it. yeah, you, you gotta take it. And then once, once they start to see that after you've taken it, and you have something worthy, then you'll have a better chance. Uh-huh. Um, you're still gonna encounter some bullshit, but. Now, now they know you mean business, and um, they're when they know you mean business, they they have to look at you differently. They they can't look at you the same old way. Though, oh, we're gonna shuck and drive this Negro over here. Uh-huh. Um, <laughs> yeah, right. We, we know, know your business, uh-huh. um, and and that, and that's challenging, but life in itself is challenging. So, uh-huh. you know, we've never none of us. I've ever been given a stamp like this is gonna be easy as shit and go for it. You're gonna do it. No, it's hard for anybody, and it becomes, and you have more obstacles. Be you a person of color. It's there. Exactly. It happens. Um, this is where going back to my own family on my dad's side, I had my great grandpa. He um, he owned his own farm. He owned his own general store. Come to find out, we're finding out that he was a prominent man of his time. So much of a prominence that they actually named a state park after him in Tennessee, oh. which is which impre- which is impressive to me. But how much bullshit did he have to face, you know, to get to the prominence that he did get to? We're still learning more about him, but I think that's interesting. Uh, looking back on on my own family. Um, but I, I, it's to me, it's it's important. How does money work? How did we learn how money works in, in our capitalist society? How money works in other societies? What works best, so forth and so on. I, I think that's I think it's important that that we learn all that. But yeah, some people yeah. may say that that's they'll say that's boring. So forth. I I get if you I get if you say it's boring. I, I get you on that. But at least understand the basics. You know, so that's that, what I say yeah. all the time because, like, I I, I studied po- on politics when I was in college, and I always okay. tell people when I because I was I was like I was always a science, politics, and history person. I, I love those subjects, but I've always told people I understand that politics and government can be boring. It can be very right. very boring, but yeah. know something about it because it affects everything right. you do. If you that's don't right. know anything, yeah, if you don't know anything about it, someone else will be deciding for you. And they do know about it, and they know exactly how it'll damage you, you know. So That's you right. gotta think about it. And, and and the thing is that that I've noticed a lot about when it comes to the to the um to black politics in the, in America, a lot of the grassroots, unfortunately, well, not not I won't even say the grassroots. The grassroots know. The grassroots know. But I'm talking about like the online activism, people who speak out online a lot. They don't know how this shit works. I mean, they have no right. clue how it works. And those that do. Are not the conservatives like Candace Can- Can- Owens. The conservatives like Candace Can- Owens just know how to grift. The conservatives like right. Brandon Tatum, they just know how to how to how to tap dance. 
That's all they know right. how to do. They just know how to grip and tap dance. If you look at like like um the black people who uh who are conservative, they don't mm-hmm. actually know how government works. They just yeah. they just tap dance and know how to grift. But the people right. the black people who do know how government works, they're usually progressive, almost all yes. the time. Progressive. Yes. Yeah, you know, because they they know what to do. You feel me? And they and they if they want to help their people out, they'll know exactly what to do to other people out. They know that it all comes down to policy. It doesn't come down to saying all this rhetoric of you know stop listening to Cardi B and Sexy Red. It doesn't come down to that. It doesn't come down to saying oh Philando Castile shouldn't have reached for something. It doesn't come down to that. That's not gonna help us. Yeah, you know I mean, though, right. things that's gonna help us is actual policy. And when I learned that, that's when I learned that I cannot be a conservative because even the greatest conservative black conservative ever, people like Thomas Sowell. If you read yeah. what he said, it's basically all rehash Austrian economics and, you yeah. know, tap dancing. That's all it is. You know I mean, he, he doesn't actually propose any actual policy that will help black people. The only thing he, had, he repeats is tax cuts and, you know, everybody go to church. That's all he does. You know what I mean? There's yeah. no actual policy there. There's no actual thing there. But if you read like George Jackson, if you read Angela Davis, you know what I mean? Right. If you read um, Marcus Lamont Hill or people like that. They actually give you a policy thing that will actually help black people out. The rest of them don't. You know what I mean, I, I'm sorry to go ahead on my rant. I was, just, I, just, I kind of love. No, no, policy. no. You're good. You're good. You're good. I'm sorry, I kind of love policy. I'm hoping that this will be one of the conversations that can help inspire people to first understand what's going on and then act upon it. Exactly. Um, because we can easily get pushed out the way. Mm-hmm easy and we have to understand how we're not going to take that you know um expect in the experiences that i've had you know talking with all these different people that i've had to talk to through all these different backgrounds it's interesting when you know your shit how people start taking you seriously uh-huh. how they change up oh wait a minute well you know it's it's interesting um i think that should be part of the goal Learning should be just, in my opinion, learning should be one of those lifelong goals, you know, to always learn and reexamining our value systems as well, because if it's no longer worth it, if it's no longer of any value, it's time to change up. If it's holding you back, it's time to change up Um, and, and change since sometimes change can be incredibly difficult, Uh, but you got to go with it. Even nature itself, changes constantly you know nature abhors anything that wants to stay the same Uh so like nature we have to be able to adapt and as as i become older especially with my day job uh i notice a lot of people that are older that don't adapt or just can't adapt and then Uh when certain realities hit they're like Oh my God, what am I going to do? And it's like, what you should have done was kept an open mind. And yeah. as, as I become older, I have a hard time understanding why other older, much older folks didn't understand that change is a constant. You know it. All the changes you've seen in your life, and now you want to just be stuck on this one thing, <laughs> it, it does you more harm than good. And you don't mm-hmm. even realize that. So I think if you're going to, to cultivate more of a youthful attitude, which I think is good, that's mentally healthy, which can turn into physically healthy too. Uh-huh. But they, they keep that sense of wonderment, of being astounded. You know, that helps keep you going. And you got to keep on pushing and pushing and pushing. Um, Will racism ever be totally eradicated nope but i'm all for if they want to go and talk about how racist they are go for it i i, I don't want them to stop because i want to know who i'm dealing with yeah you know? yeah I but agree for, with that. yep but for those that are looking to change your value systems when it comes to race or those are like no i think you have as much to contribute as i do yeah let's let's ride with them true um gotcha. but these other folks let them go to hell. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let them go to hell. Um, but it's it's life itself is interesting, 
becoming a non-believer, it opened my eyes up to a lot of different things. Uh, it also helped me to be more empathetic to people, even though I did have my bout of being that that mad new non-believer. Because they even had my whole tip face. I yeah. I had had a <laughs> When I first hey, ran into Umar Johnson, I had a little bit of old tough oh, face. So. Yeah. When I first I, ran into him, I was like, I, I haven't seen a black person speak like that since since MLK. So it was like, I had a whole tough face, you know. Umar, uh, yeah. these days when I look at Umar, oh. he, he's 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 hilarious. At the, at the, he should just be a comedian, <laughs> tell you the truth. At at this point in time, I think he's doing it on purpose. <laughs> you know, what I mean? at this point Agreed. in time, I don't really think he's just he's, doing it on purpose because he knows he's a meme and he knows he's gonna get her money, so he's just doing it on purpose. Right. Right, exactly, exactly. Because he's wanting to build this school forever, but now more people have been more yeah. critical of him. Like, dude, uh, LeBron James at? has his goal on now. Where's yours? Mm -hmm. Um, pardon me, he's a joke. Yeah. He's a joke, but he wants he he he's in for the entertainment. I think a new term that I think many of us should entertain is political entertainment. When prime time comes on and CNN is doing their thing and Fox News is doing their thing, I think you really have to look at that as political entertainment. It's all entertainment because yeah. these, yeah, because these folks are looking to gaslight, to say some of the most craziest things. That's what they want to do, and exactly. we have to understand that that's nothing but political entertainment. If you want to become more knowledgeable. Um, you gotta, you gotta open up a book. Um, you know, yeah, it won't teach go you to nothing. Google. Yeah, exactly. And and um, the thing I, is, like, I I get that it's entertainment, but like, I I've, I realized over the past probably 10, 15 years, news entertainment can be and political entertainment can be very very dangerous because yes. while j just like how we say like because things like politics and news, um, it's implied that they're informing you of something. If you make entertainment out of it, you don't really have to inform people. You just have to either make them laugh, make them angry, or get some sort of emotion out of them. And you can do that easily through lies, very, very easily. Yes. So it's it's like I mean, rap is entertaining, but I don't believe all these rappers are actually shooting people. I don't I don't believe they're not doing that. You know what I mean? I don't believe these rappers are. Um, I don't believe these these female rappers are out here just flashing their coochie to the world. They're not doing that. Yeah, I mean, but it's very, very entertaining because it, it gives an image in our head. It makes people want to get up and dance. You know what I mean? It, it's very, very raunchy. Right. So, like, it it makes it, it does all that. But it's entertainment. We know they're not doing that for real. But if you right. put that into, into the realm of politics, and it's implied within politics that these are things that can actually happen, mm -hmm. it's a big problem because now you're saying that this leader of this state or this politician – who leads these constituents or this group of people, yeah, I mean, are this certain type of way, even mm -hmm. though it's supposed to be for entertainment, you rile a bunch of people up with a whole bunch of lies that they think is real, you know? Yeah. So, and, and that's the, that's the issue that I've always had with political entertainment, sports entertainment, like, you know, like, um, WWF, I, I, I still love it. I mean, I, I still love the. I'm, I'm gonna start watching it again. You and Sean. You and Sean. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Sean, I haven't seen it in years. Yeah, I haven't yeah, seen it in years. Yeah. I want to watch it again. You know what I mean? But it's like, I were. I, I knew that Stone Cold Steve Austin and The Rock were acting. I knew they were just acting. You okay. know what I mean? I didn't think that they were actually. They went backstage and actually fought each other. They didn't do that. Right. <laughs> you know, so they're, they're yeah, all just acting. They would break character. Since mm -hmm. I didn't break character, you'd see and they'll go, be laughing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so they'll break character. So it's uh -huh. it's like you know it's it's it it's all it's all for our entertainment, but it's fun, you know. But yeah. like things like politics is not supposed to be just for fun. It's supposed to be like something informative, you know. And that's supposed the word. To be. It's supposed I to be. remember, I remember being a little kid and turning on the news because that was that was you know we'd have dinner together as a family, and we turn the news on. Dad would turn the news on. Mm -hmm. Six o'clock, there was Walter Concrete reading the news, then you made up your own mind. Mm -hmm. Uh 60 minutes. My dad made us what well, I don't know, made, but one television in the house. You know, dad wasn't now. We're not watching the Disney movie, we're watching 60 minutes. Mm -hmm. And um, because I was I remember we'd have these contests in school that would ask about current events, stuff like that. And I always had I was always up on my current events because it was the news. I was, in a way, forced to read, 
the, the, to watch the news, but I didn't mind it so much. I was I was inquisitive. I was like, oh, okay, that's what's going on. And I felt that I could have a better conversation with folks even back then. Um, so, yeah, it's political entertainment, the news the way it used to be to where it is now, the distrust of, uh, of uh, legacy media now. Mm-hmm. Um, what, what gets me, though, is that legacy media knows that they're not trusted and their audience may be shrinking, but yet they're still doing the same bullshit. People still distrust them. Yeah. And and they're finding other ways to get their news, which is drawing the box. Their ratings are great, but they appeal to a more older crowd. But yeah, that older crowd will eventually die off. They'll all die. Yeah, exactly. They're all, they're all going to die. So it's like, what's going to happen in the next fifteen years when all when half of Fox's, you know, news and when half of Fox's watchers are dead? What's going to happen? Right. You know, and I I, I, exactly. I think that's what you said. They're 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 looking into more ways, which is why we have, you know, the Ben Shapiro's doing the Daily Wire and stuff like that. You know, I mean, that's why you have pe- people like that because that's going to be the next Fox. You know, and they 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 need yeah. that, and they're they're not gonna they're not gonna get high, like they're not. They're not gonna, you know, get a job offer from, or they're not gonna accept a job offer from Fox because they're making way more money doing what they're doing already. So they're not gonna take that sure. that job offer, you know. So, but exactly. I, I do. I, uh, we are have be, been here for an hour and a half. I do need to ask you one last question. All right. Yes. Just one last question, and then we could go ahead and send you off. So, okay. Like we've always said, we got into politics. We got into a huge thing of politics, but this ties into that. When it comes to black non-believers, this is what I've always seen, always noticed. We don't have visibility, um, and we don't have visibility overall within society, especially within black, within like atheist. I guess you could call it culture. Within atheist culture, we don't have a lot of visibility. But also, even within our own community, with, even within our own black community, we are villainized. There is no piece of black media where an atheist is seen in a positive light. None. Zero, not at all. I've I've looked. There is no piece of black media where people who are who don't believe in some sort of they're not Muslim, they're Christian. If it's not one of those two things, we're not seeing a positive light. So because of that, because we don't have visibility, because we're not seeing a positive light, I personally feel that we should be more active and more vocal, which is why I do this here, which is why I have this mm-hmm. platform, and which is why I do my online discussions and debates and stuff like that on TikTok. That's mm-hmm. the reason why I do that. To give us more visibility and to normalize us, you know what I mean. Now, a lot of people would say that's all going to well to do, but what we should also be focusing on is building a safe space or a safe community for us, because a lot of us are disconnected. We don't all live in the same places. Like I live in Florida, there's not a lot of us here, so they think that we should be more building a that community first and focus on that than you know, kind of arguing with Christians, Muslims, and Hebrew Israelites. Now, for me, I think we can do both. I think we can walk in true gum. I do want to build that safe community, but I also feel that we need to be out there, be more forcefully visible because every piece of media that we have does not have us vis- be visible like that. It doesn't at all. Like even, you know, platforms like the shade room and spiritual world, they're ran by Christians, but yeah. even they have happy Ramadan. So right. black Muslims do have a platform. They have visibility. Black Christians mm-hmm. definitely have visibility. We don't. Yes. We're villainized most of the time. You know what I mean? So it's like, that's why I do this. And that's why I think that we should be more outspoken while we're building a community for ourselves. What do you think? I'm going to agree with you. I think we are a minority in a minority. And if you're a woman, you're a minority in a minority in a minority. All right. We do need more visibility. We are not a monolith of ideas. We have a very rich diversity of ideas in our communities, and that needs to be brought out. Uh Um, I could think of a lot of great conversations that I've had with many other atheists of color. Uh, And it's been, though I may not agree with them, I'm so happy that we've had this conversation because now I've had the opportunity to understand them better. 
it, I think if we can broadcast that we're rich in, we're rich in thoughts, this is who we are. You are not to demonize us because we now have a voice. Mm -hmm. And we will roar when you try to demonize us. Look at Steve Harvey, the comments he's made. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure if you and I thought long enough uh, today, we could think of other celebrities that have also demoned us. I didn't think it shows. Yep. Oh, yeah, Cat Williams. And Cat Williams should know better. He should know better. Mm -hmm. He shouldn't. Oh, he should know better. But he wants that mouth because he wants attention because he can get paid. Uh -huh. And yes, we need to combat that um, so that they can go, oh, wait a minute, and offer us that respect. We should have that respect. We should have it automatically from everything that we've gone through historically, but we don't. And I feel like Southern Blacks seem to be more united on things than Northern Blacks. Uh -huh. um, and that though we may have our differences still, when you see the rich tapestry of thought that we all have, I mean, to me, it's incredible, you know, because we, in general, we've never been, you know, shown how rich we are in thought and talent and so forth and so on. We're, we're not, and we do need to get out there. Uh, I, when I started seeing your interviews and stuff like that, you know, I was like, oh, man, I didn't know. I didn't know about you. And I didn't know about all these different interviews so forth and so on. So when I listened to the different interviews and I was like, wow, these this is really nice getting them. Some of the people I knew, some of the people I, de I didn't know. And it was really fulfilling to hear these other people finally talk instead mm -hmm. of just reading what they may say. It's like now and I'm getting to hear them talk. Mm -hmm. I you get to see their energy, so forth and so on. And it's to me, it's a re really rewarding experience with what you're doing because I haven't really seen somebody do it at the level that you do it. I've seen attempts for it, mm -hmm. but I haven't seen it done at the level that you're aiming for, your goal. Um, it will be nice to see you interview more people. It will be nice to see us as a more organized group. Because white folks, the non-believing white folks, they definitely got it all over the place. They got it. Mm -hmm. They got it. You know, and mm -hmm. we we do have a few. We have black non-believers, but stuff in mm -hmm. there gets messy. Yeah, you know what I mean. So it's yeah, like, yeah. You know, messy. And I already know if, if this gets bigger one day, I'm going to have to interview Bandita Thomas one day. I, I I know that, and that's might be a doozy. <laughs> yeah, you know, because I got questions. It will be. Yeah, but so. you know what? You know what? I'm I'm, I'm really curious about. 50 to 100 years from now, if these series of interviews are dug up, how will we be viewed then after we've accomplished what we've accomplished in our lifetimes? Right. I'm really curious about that. I would love to see us rediscovered another 50, 100 years. Maybe we will have what, what that goal is and we'll organize a, a much more bigger organized group. I think it's, I think I'm, I'm more encouraged that it is going to happen because more people of color are leaving the church or yeah. they're going very infrequently because they have questions. I mean, they're still in doctrine, but they have some good questions. They do. You know, um, it's interesting, especially women, because statistically there are more women in the church. Men mm -hmm. are more like, mm, yeah. and they have their different reasons. Yeah, they're different uh, but to see the women, to see women wake up and discover new information and say, wait a minute, this doesn't work like I've been taught. That's it. That's interesting to see. Yeah. Because yeah, definitely want to see that. Yeah. Because some, some of the strongest religious figures in my family have been women. Um, and you see them come away from that. Sure, there's all different ideas about why why there are so many more women in the church. That's a whole other conversation, of course. Mm -hmm. um, but to see them come out of those psychological restraints is, is going to be more interesting as time goes on. And because they're, they're going to have better 
they're going definitely going to develop even better reasons why they're leaving. I think with each successive generation, better arguments are given for the reason why we don't believe. Um, yeah. And that's oh. interesting. Always, man. But they, I really do appreciate you for um for being here. You let you let me go on on my whole political rant, and I appreciate <laughs> you for it. yeah, we sure, um. Man. Last thing, if you have any, you know, uh, platforms or business or social media or anything like that, go ahead and promote it now, and I'll make sure that I put it into the description. I mean, there's some things I have percolating in the pot. I mean, I do have my own FB group, um, along with others like Heather, Tamiko, um, um, Jai, uh, one other person. I'm sorry, I forgot her name. Uh, but she's a quiet person. She's very inter introverted. Mm -hmm. uh, we have our own group. It's called uh, The Eclipse, uh, The Black Godless Experience. Mm -hmm. um, we kind of like to keep it, it. Granted, we have we tell a bunch of jokes in there. We have memes. But sometimes we like to go more on that intellectual journey as well. Gotcha. Um, so we have that. Um, we kind of kept our numbers a little low on purpose because... The more people you have in, the more issues you're gonna have. Well, of course. But I really love it when we can talk to different people, understand their journeys, so forth and so on. And also, me, you know, as I get older and I learn more, I take a more softer approach when it comes to people. You know, because there's there's no need to browbeat because just because I may think or any other person may think this isn't the lot you're supposed to be toting. No, you're supposed to touch your own damn line. If you yeah. have your way of doing something, do it. I may not agree, but do it. If it works for you, go for it, boo boo. Um, yeah. do your thing. yeah, exactly. Um, that's uh, I'm not really gonna talk about other things that I have boiling in the pot because mm -hmm. right now I'm also considering going back to school. Um, mm -hmm. because there's some things that are going on in my life, I'm like, I'm I think it's time to make things better. I need to reevaluate some things. I think one of the things I need to do is go back to school. Um, so, and I'm going to be making a decision about that uh, this week, uh, this week coming up. Um, work will pay for it. That'll be great. Um, so, and at the same time, because of my upbringing and they don't believe in education, it's more of a, ha, 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 I do. Look what I can do. What look what I've done for myself. Look what I've done for others. So I'll just I'll just broadcast that Facebook group. Um, there are a lot of other Facebook groups out there that I like. Um, I like, uh, for example, um, Black Atheists. I think it's one of the largest uh, atheist groups on Facebook. Mm -hmm. But I also don't want to restrict myself to just Facebook. I want to, I've, you know, there's some stuff that I've seen and been involved in on discord. Um, I think I want to jump in to see what's going on on Reddit too. Mm -hmm. So, you know, stuff like that. Um, yeah. so that's what, I, that's and later on. I'll, I'll do other things, but I, there's things I'm just percolating right now. Yeah. And I have a discord as well. And I'll put that into, into the description of this. Oh, comment. nice. Oh, but, that's awesome. Yeah. That's awesome. I'm going to check it out then. No problem. All right, Nate, man, I, I do appreciate you. We're going to go ahead and get out of here. And uh, it was great talking to you. This will be great released in about two Sundays from now, all right? Two Sundays, awesome. Well, you got yeah. my number. If you ever want to hit me up, whatever, I'll hit you up, you know, because now I know you. And yeah. I'm real happy <laughs> to see. I'm real happy to see what you're doing, man. I mean, that's that, that's really encouraging. I love, I love it, man. No problem, man. I appreciate you, bro. And you have a great one, great one all right? You too. Take care. That's a good